You guys ready? Here we go. Mark chapter 6. Let me remind us of this really important fact as we go into this text. According to God, the way that God looks at this world, there are only two ultimate kingdoms. Now, we have all these nations, right? United States of America, very proud to be here, trust me, and other places around the world. But ultimately, there are only two kingdoms in the eyes of God, and every person is in one or the other. They are the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan. It's the kingdom of light or the kingdom of what? Darkness. Okay? That's the only two kingdoms. We're all born by default into the kingdom of darkness. That's why Jesus came to set us free. And he did, and he paid the price, and he made it possible when he died and rose from the dead. Now, when we believe in the gospel, when we repent of our rebellious nature that we are a part of the kingdom of darkness, and we come into the kingdom of God, get this, God doesn't just save us to enter the kingdom of God, and then that's it. He saves us to send us. He saves us, brings us into the kingdom of darkness, and now we are on a mission to help advance and grow the kingdom of God now. We are a part of the army of God now. We, are, we have a mission. Jesus' mission is our mission. Every Christian, every one of us, not just pastors, and not just when we go on short-term mission trips. This is our whole life. If you're a dentist, you're on a mission. If you're an accountant, you're on a mission. If you're a couch, couch potato, you're on a mission. Whatever, whatever your age is, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, if you are a born-again Christian, guys, we are on a mission to advance the gospel. Now, how do we advance the gospel in the kingdom of God? We share the gospel message. Every one of us are called to be sharing the good news with people around us. We also then are to make disciples of them who can make disciples, right? We teach them to obey the commands of Jesus. We work together. We do it individually. We also work together in the life of our church. This is all part of advancing the kingdom of God. And then, of course, along the way, individually, the kingdom of God is growing within us. We are becoming more like Jesus in the way that we think, in the way that we feel, in the way that we do things, okay? And so that's what it means to be advancing the kingdom of God. So in light of that, that we are all on a mission as a follower of Christ. Let me say this really quick, by the way, before we move on. If you're not born again, if you're not part of the kingdom of God, the good news is for you today. Jesus died a death that you deserve for your sins, and he rose from the dead, something you could not do. And when he did, he conquered the power of sin in your life. And he conquered the power of hell and Satan over you. And then he's inviting you today. Right now, he's inviting you. Are you willing to believe what I just said? Believe the gospel that he did that for you. To confess that you are a rebel by your sin and say, Jesus, please forgive me. And from this day forward, I am yours. If you're willing to do that, you can enter the kingdom of God too. Okay, Now, for those of us who have entered the kingdom of God, we're on a mission. And what we're going to see in our text in, in, in Mark chapter 6, we're going to see three lessons. That when we're on mission for the kingdom of God, three lessons. And so let's look at, jump into verse 30. And, and we're going to read there. So look at it. The apostles, that's the disciples, the 12. They returned to, G to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Now, we're jumping in here. If you've been with us, you might know where we're at. If you haven't been with us, you have no idea. Where are they returning from? Now, if you do remember, a couple weeks ago, uh, in verses 7 through 13 in this chapter, Jesus sent the 12 out on a mission trip. Remember that? And what he did is he said, hey, I'm going to send you out in pairs, and you're going to go door to door around the villages of this area of Israel, and you're going to tell people the gospel message. You're going to say the Messiah, the Messiah has come, and his name is Yeshua. His name is Jesus. He is here. Believe and repent and enter the kingdom of God. And so they're going door to door, and then as also as they're going and giving the gospel, they're also healing people and their sicknesses in the name of Jesus, and they're casting demons out. And so they do this uh, mission trip to advance the kingdom of God because they're being trained by Jesus that someday they're going to be sent out for, for good from Jesus. But this is a short-term mission trip, a part of this discipleship relationship. They return from that trip. That's what's going on here. So they return. They tell Jesus all they had done and, and did. And then look at verse 31. So then Jesus says to them, come away 
by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no uh, leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place to themselves. Now, I never realized how busy Jesus was in this time of his life, how, how big the crowds were pressing in on him until, until planting this church, and that we've been going verse by verse through the gospel of Mark. And we're six chapters now into it. And it is pretty crazy how often Mark is recording the fact that there are these throngs of people so tight. This is the second time in six chapters that we are hearing that, that the, they were so busy and so crowded, they couldn't even eat. Second time in six chapters. I mean, has anybody here ever been so busy and also crowded with people that even when you wanted to eat, you couldn't eat? I, I can't relate to that. Okay, so I mean, this is how busy and the thousands and thousands of people that are around Jesus here in the Capernaum area, in the Sea of Galilee area, and so they can't even eat again. So what does Jesus say? He's like, let's get away. Let's go to a desolate place where there's no people. And so right here is our first lesson. You and I, we're, when we're on mission in our life, no matter what we're doing, we're out there always looking for opportunities to share the gospel, to make disciple makers. We need to take breaks. We need to take breaks. That's what Jesus is doing here, right? Now, Jesus was 100% God, right? But he was also 100% what? Man. Man, at the same time. It's called the hypostatic union. Write that down. Hypostatic union. By the way, one of the things about our church I want us to be known for is that we are not afraid of theological terms. We're not afraid of even original language terms like Yeshua or Meshiach or all these things. I, I think there's a value and a richness in these things. And too many churches and pastors are like, people are just too dumb to appreciate these things. Honestly, okay? You guys are not dumb. Okay? Nobody's that dumb. And I think I'm going to serve you well and give you these things if you want. And now you don't have to take it, but here's the thing. Hypostatic union. What does that mean? Is that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man perfectly together at the same time. Now, why am I saying that? It's because Jesus, who is 100% man, he laid aside some of his divine attributes, Philippians chapter 2, when he came to this world which means that he allowed himself to get tired when the crowds were all around him and to get hungry when his physical body needed food. Now, he's God. He could have went without it. But he laid aside some of those divine attributes to enter into humanity like you and I because he wants to relate with us because he wants to help us when we go through our struggles. Also so that he can satisfy the wrath of God by dying on the cross as a man. Okay? But so he lays these things aside. But so he needs a break. But remember again, he's 100% God though too. Now, remind me, everybody here in the room, what percent God are you and I? Zero. That's the correct answer. If you thought anything above that, wrong theology. You are, okay, I was just out in Sedona. There are people out there, I think, that think that they are partly divine out there. Okay, there's some weird stuff going on, some of those vortexes and so forth. Anyway, so um, listen, we are, not, we are only human beings. So if Jesus, who is 100% God, needed a break, how much more do you and I need a break? You see? We need breaks, guys. Doing ministry can get hard. Sharing the gospel can be hard. Living on, on, on mission, no matter, again, what our career is, if we're a student in school, you're trying to live for Jesus Christ, you're stand, trying to stand for the Lord, you're trying to make disciples who make disciples, we need breaks sometimes. So what can that look like? Well, here's a few ways. One, some of us, you know, all of us, we need like some personal vacations once in a while, Okay. Life is busy. Again, I'm doing my career. I'm also living on mission in my workplace. I've got my family. I'm trying to disciple my family. If you're a parent, um, your, your spouse trying to be a godly husband or wife. I mean, all these things in life. Guys, we need vacations. We need breaks sometimes. And uh, it's really fun that when I uh, started reading this text, I was on a vacation myself. When I'm reading about how Jesus says we need to get away to a desolate place. Because I can tell you this personally, I needed a vacation 
Okay? Now, hear me really clear. I am not trying to hold a candlestick to the busyness of Jesus. Okay? Okay? I am not saying that. But, but I have been busy in my life over the last year. You know, over the last two Januarys ago, getting assessed to, to, to plant a church through the SBC, then doing all the training, and then, then trying to build a core group with starting with my five of my family and trying to find other crazy people that would be willing to plant a church with us for the glory of Jesus and, and, and find, you know, having 39 of us, praise the Lord for that, but going through all of the core group phase and then launching the church back in October and doing all of that and then five months almost now of a church and it's been busy. And we needed to get away, and this is something the Lord's taught me many years ago about, like, I, you know, you, you play hard, you work hard, but you need to, you need to rest, right? And, and when it's not just taking a vacation, it's taking a vacation, and part of that vacation is saying, Lord, here I am. Lord, just meet with me in this time of rest. I'm breaking away from this ongoing ministry over here, but here I am. I need you to, to refresh me and to get me going back on track so I come back fired up. So take personal vacations. Have you guys, some of you, maybe you need a personal vacation coming up or your family. Are you doing that? Some people are workaholics. Say they're in love. Need a break away, okay? Spend time with the family. You got kids. Don't, you only get so much time with them. Don't, don't, don't sit there and regret it later, right? No one on their deathbed says, I, w- I wish I worked more, Right? You see what I'm saying? And so let's take breaks in the Lord and spend time with him and the family. All right, here's another way we can rest and take breaks is even when we work together as a church uh, on what we call our serving teams. Now, even those of you that were with me in the interest days and the core group days, you remember constantly I said, hey, as we work together in these teams, like worship, AV, kids, set up, welcome team, all these different teams, we don't want people serving every Sunday. Why? Because burnout is a real issue. We need to have a breathable rhythm of taking breaks and then serve so that, Lord willing, as much as possible, we can serve from an overflow, not on fumes. And so we set out our sweet spot is that we want people serving on teams once every three weeks. It's a very sustainable, ongoing rhythm where when I go, I'm excited to go serve. But again, it's not every week and I'm drowning and I'm burning out because that happens, especially in church plants. By God's grace, we were able to start with people serving once every other week, and some of our teams are really close, if not already there, to getting to serve once every three weeks because we need to take some breaks as we're serving the Lord and on mission working together. By the way, I'll do a shameless plug. If you're not on a serving team, would you jump on a serving team and help us get to that healthy rhythm of once every three? Highlighted ones is worship and AV, kids and setup teams. We'd love to have you jump on board there. Here's one final way that we need. We can take spiritual breaks like Jesus did. And we saw him here. He's with the group, but there's other times he would just go away. And sometimes we just need to take a spiritual retreat. And I'm not talking about like for days on end, although if you want to do that, that's awesome. I'm saying, here's a secret that I, I, I learned many, many years ago when I was a teen. Spend 30 to 60 minutes on a walk in the woods with Jesus, and you would be surprised how refreshing your soul will be in just 30 to 60 minutes, okay? In the woods. Now, I'm not talking about in the neighborhood. I, I'm, not, I'm not getting legalistic here, but here, here's what happens for me with the neighborhood, I'm talking to my neighbors. It's great, you know, but I'm like trying to talk to the Lord, but then now I'm talking to neighbors, right, which you should be. Or I'm, you know, you're going through the neighborhood and the dog's starting to bite your heel or something, or, or you walk through the neighborhood and you look at stuff in people's yards and you know what I mean? And maybe this is just me and I'm unofficially diagnosed ADD. I don't know. But what I find is when you go into the woods, though, you get away from all things. And this is what Jesus did. He did. He went away from people when you would spend time with the Father in times of prayer, and just walking out there, you'd be surprised how much your soul gets healed and ministered to by Jesus Christ away. And so some of us, maybe that's just what we need to do this week. Say, you know what? I'm going to take a 30 to 60 minute walk in some woods, preserve somewhere. And uh, trust me, I've, I've pinpointed where all the preserves are around here because I love to do this, and I just encourage you to do the same thing. All right, so we need to take breaks when we're on mission. Let's read on. Look at verse 33. Now, many, that's the crowd, they saw them, the disciples, going in the boat, and they recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So imagine they are running along the Sea of Galilee shore, and Jesus and the disciples are on the boats, 
and they're out, but they can see them. So they're running where they think they're going on the boat. And they're running, and they get to where he's at in verse 34. When Jesus went ashore, again, why, why is he going, why is he on the boat? Why is he going to the other side? To get away from the crowd. Remember that? So when he gets, went to shore, he saw a great crowd. And he was royally ticked. And Jesus said, are you kidding me? Can't a man get some rest from you heathens? You selfish little human. No, I mean, he don't, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's not what it says. This is why you need to have a Bible in your own hand, okay? No, what, what does Jesus do when he sees a crowd that he's trying to get away from? Look at it. He had compassion on them. Wow. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. You see, when we're on a, a vacation, we're on a spiritual walk, we're trying to get some rest and break away. But what do we do if God brings someone in that time of rest before us and in across our life that maybe needs some ministry or needs this gospel shared with them? What did Jesus do? Jesus had compassion on them and he ministered to them. I, I personally, guys, to be honest, I'm very convicted by this because I love to shut things off. I love to get my own time and I got my, I've done my, I've done a lot of work and I have, I'm not, you know, but, but like this is my time, you know. And, but guys, listen, we are never on vacation ultimately from the mission that we're on. And, and so uh, I've, I've tried to learn this through the years. And so like, for instance, even this last vacation, even though I'm trying to get rest from a lot of ministry and things like that, um, and spend time with the family and all of that. But listen, again, I've learned that we are never on a vacation from sharing the gospel with people. Never. And, uh, and so I asked my DX group, say, guys, pray for me. Hold me accountable like we are to each other. You know, I, I, on this trip that I want to be able to share the gospel with at least one person. And so they were praying, and there's power in prayer. And uh, sure enough, the first the flight out there, um, I get sat between two guys. The one guy you know, literally get there, put the stuff up, sit down. He goes, he's out. He's making it really clear. He does not want to talk to anybody. Okay, he's like, out, you know. The other guy was the opposite. This guy's like 60-some years old, retired, and he's just talking about, I mean, just, you just, and I'm sitting there going, Lord, you're answering my prayer. This guy is willing to talk about anything. This is going to be easy, you know. And, and sure enough, through the flight, you know, he finally gets to the place. You know, you know how it's when you're meeting someone new, eventually you get to the career conversation part, or part of it. You know, so what do you do? I'm like, well, I do social work. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> to, believe it or not, I know pastors who will throw that out specifically on vacations because they don't want to talk about ministry and the gospel. And so they cloak it by saying they do social work. And to be honest, I've had those temptations myself. But that is not, we are never on a vacation. And so sure enough, so I say, no, you know, I'm a pastor. And, and it just went into, you know, conversation, his church background, found out that he's spiritually confused uh, about what the gospel is. So, so I did what I've been doing a lot lately. I just say, okay, so can I ask you this? Have you ever heard what the good news of Christianity really is? No, I don't think so. Okay, let me tell you. And got to share the gospel with him. And it was a great conversation with this guy. Okay. And so, again, we're never on vacation. Or how about this? This happens every day for a lot of us. We work really hard or we're, we're tending to the kids all day and we're tired at the end of the day. Man, I, I have so many days like that. It's like I'm, I'm now home. I've been doing all this work. I just want to go inside. I want to get a Powerade or a whiskey or a wine, whatever kind of day it was. And I just want to relax a little bit and I just want to turn things off and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to talk to anybody. But what happens when God brings someone to my door, what happens when I happen to be in my yard and someone's walking by? What happens when, you see what I'm saying? And, and, I, and I'm, I have to remind myself, it's like, yes, I want to rest, but ultimately I am never on a mission as long as I'm on this planet. I'm never on a vacation, sorry, from my mission as long as I'm on this planet. And think about this like soldiers 
Okay? We are in the army of God, are we not? We are all soldiers. So imagine this, that in that analogy, that we're soldiers and there's a bunch of hostages that need to be set free. That's lost people, not born again. They're part of the kingdom of God. They're slaves to sin and to Satan, right? And so the enemy is Satan in sin, and we are at a war with them, and we're trying to rescue lost people. So imagine in that analogy that there's these soldiers they're on a mission, they're in the war zone, but they're taking a break, which they need to take a break. But as they're taking a break, they're kind of in hiding off a road and they see the enemy leading a bunch of hostages on the road. And they're like, yeah, it's too bad. We would rescue them, but we're on a break right now. <laughs> right? It's funny because it's ridiculous. Because when we're, in, when we're in a war zone, we're never ultimately on a break from doing our job, are we? We're never ultimately on a break from reaching the lost. And so if you haven't caught the second point here, when we're on mission, we need to take breaks. But also, when we're on mission, break from your break if a need arises. Break from your break if a need arises that God brings our way. And so some of us, if you're like I've been a lot in my life, I have to just sit there and remind myself, listen, Ryan, when you go shut off, don't completely shut off if God brings someone in your life in those times. Be willing to break away from it. Again, Jesus, he's trying to get away. The people follow him, and he doesn't say, guys, get away from me. I'm taking a break. He ministers to them once again. He's our model. All right, let's read on if we're going to get one more lesson about the idea that when we're on mission in our life, we're sharing the gospel with coworkers, friends, neighbors, and classmates. We're making disciples who make disciples. We need to take breaks. We need to break away from our breaks if, we need, if a need arises. And then here's in verse 35, let's find a third thing. In verse 35, it says, and when it grew late. So even right there, you catch how long has Jesus been ministering and teaching this crowd? It's not like he says, okay, guys, I'll, I'll talk to one of you, that's it, and then I'm taking my break, right? It's growing late. He is just constantly pouring into the crowd for a long time and, and to where it becomes like evening dinner time in the day. And so it says that then his disciples came to him, look at verse 35 there, and they said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Remember, again, they purposely went to a place where there's no one that lives there. But now there's Jesus and the 12 disciples and a crowd of people, lots and lots of people, thousands of people. In fact, when you get to the end of the text, 5,000 men, which means 10 to 15,000 people crowd in a desolate place. And they say the hour is late, verse 36, and they say, send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus said to them, check this out. You give them something to eat. Think about that. Jesus is like, you guys, you give them something to eat. Okay? Again, 10 to 15,000 people. You give them something to eat. Man, this, this is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty, it's comical. It's, it's so interesting. So let me hit this home. Okay, we have the Church and Park event coming up on April 10th. Lord willing, let's say we have 1,000 people show up. Between our people and the Crossing Church people and all the community guests and everybody, we have a 1,000 people. Would you pray with me, by the way, that God brings like a lot of people to this event? And also, let's invite, invite, invite. By the way, these invitation cards are actually underneath your seats as well. So feel free to at least take that one. If not more, there's out in the lobby. But let's invite. And so let's say, though, that, that we're there now on April 10th. We have a 1,000 people show up at the worship service part. Now, we, we are planning to, to feed people through the food trucks that we've ordered to come there. Now, we're getting, we're done with the service. We're like, where's the food trucks? The food trucks don't show up. Now, also, the coolest thing that happens that day is Jesus decides to come back and, and to come, and he's at our event. He shows up. That'd be awesome. And so Jesus is there. And so but I'm like sitting there going, and Jennifer leads our kids' ministries. She's like, we're getting ready for the egg hunt, and we, we have these food trucks. We have 1,000 people here. There's no food there. It's not here. We don't want 1,000 people to have a negative taste in their mouth about our churches and about Jesus. You, I mean, this is not going to be good PR for you, Jesus. We need to cancel the egg hunt because there's no food. And Jesus says to, to us saying, well, you guys feed them. <laughs> That's what's going on here. 
I'd be like, what are, you, what are you talking about? There's a lot of people here. We don't, what are you talking he's, he's turning it and he's testing them. He's training them on this. And so uh, what, does, what do they say in verse 37 when he says you give them something to eat? It says that they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? 200 denarii. So let me help you understand what's going on here. 200 denarii would be about 10 months of a salary in that day of working. 10 months. So in St. John's County, I did some of the math, the average uh, individual income, salary, and, and so forth. In 10 months would be about $30,000. Okay? So, so they're like, listen, even if we have $10,000, okay, it's not going to do a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, $30,000. Sorry, $30,000 is not going to do a lot. Now, if you take $30,000 and you take that to about 10 to 15,000 mouths that they need to feed in this crowd, it's about two to three dollars worth of, of food for each person. What food can we buy today with two to three dollars? Yeah? Uh, you know, anybody want to throw out, what, what can you buy for two or three dollars? Like, uh, what was that sandwich? What? Sam's Club Hot Dog. All right, we're getting a bunch of Sam's Club hot dogs. Yes. And doesn't Costco have their own version of that too, or am I just mixing those up? Yeah. And like, what else? Anything else for two, three dollars? Yes, yes, yes. I was thinking like a beef jerky, beef jerky stick from like gas stations. You know, like, like really healthy stuff for two to three dollars, man, right? Hot dogs, beef jerky stick. Yeah, like, okay. Like, I know I'd be saying, Jesus, I'll take my, place my order. I'd like a small Baja Mountain Dew from Taco Bell. That's all I want, Jesus. Um, okay, so, so we're not getting a lot of food for each mouth with $30,000 with ten to 15,000 people, okay? And here's the funny thing. They don't even have the $30,000. They don't have any, they don't have the money. This is actually Philip in, in Gospel of John tells us this. He's the one that comes up with it. Like, listen, even if we had $30,000, we couldn't even like, you know, it'd only be like two, three dollars a person. It wouldn't be a lot of food. And we don't even have that. That's what's funny here. They don't have anything to give. So what does Jesus say? Look at verse 38. And so Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. This is, it just gets so funny, guys. So let's go back to our church in the park. Jesus says, well, you guys feed them. And we're like, listen, we don't, we don't have any money. We don't have anything. You know, what are you talking about, Jesus? He's like, all right, guys, look in your pockets and in your bags that you brought here. And let's find out how much food that you all brought. Okay? So this is, I thought this was going to be so fun. I was looking forward to this, planning this this week. You will not get in trouble if you raise your hand when I ask this question. There's my precursor. It, does anybody here have any food in your pocket or in your bag right now in this room? I see that hand. Anybody else? Any other food in this room? Okay. What do you, what do you have? I have some applesauce. Applesauce? <laughs> I, have, I have two applesauces and, and an orange and water. Two applesauces and an orange and water. Love it. Oh, and we have, what, I can't see it. Tomatoes. Cookies. Bread. Wow. Lunch meat. All right, well, there you go. And we got more food over here. What do we have here? Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh, we have more over here, yes? Quail eggs. That is so awesome. I've never had a quail egg, and I need to have one. That is so cool. So let's just think about this. This is what's going on. I see more food. Beef jerky stick. Got to have them. Anybody have gum? That's nutritious. No, it's good. Okay. <laughs> Don't swallow your gum, kids. Okay. So, so think, this is what Jesus does. Now, even this is interesting. In this room, that was actually a lot more food than I thought was in this room. Okay. <laughs> now, the disciples go off into a crowd of ten to 15,000 people and look Look what they find. It says in verse 38, when they had found out, they said, here you go. I can always imagine the disciples like, here's five loaves of bread and two fish. That's what they find. Out of 10 to 15,000 people. Okay. Now, also what's fascinating is you learn from the gospel of John 
that it was, and this is really fun too, one of the translations, the English translations, it says, it's Phillips who's talking, really, and he's like, he's like, look, we found a wee lad. I love that. Apparently an Irish lad found his way into the Israeli crowd in that one translation. There was a wee lad with a, a bread, five loaves of bread and two fish. So only one kid in the 10 to 15,000 people even had any food, and it was all his. It was it. It was it. Okay? And so, and so here's the bread. Now, here's another fascinating thing. You think about this. Whoever this boy's mama is, is the best mama on the planet. Because she's smart. She packed her kid a lunch, man. Right? I mean, like, nobody else did it, but she did. I can't wait to meet her. She was, she's awesome. She's a Martha, that's for sure. Now, now but here, here's the thing, though. What's interesting. You think, though, like, okay, really, of all those people, and we had more food in this room, how, how and why did only one mom actually pack her, her kid some food? Here's why. Remember the context. This is why it's so important, guys, to read through context. It puts everything together. Was this crowd planning to be there at that moment that day? Remember? They were with Jesus. Jesus is like the disciples come back from their mission trip. He's like, hey, guys, let's get away. They go away. The crowd, though, this is so cool. I can't wait to say this part. I was looking forward to this. The crowd, sorry, I get excited. Jesus is awesome. His word is amazing. And, and, so, and so Jesus is like, guys, we got to get away. We've got to take breaks. It's healthy. The crowd, though, they're like, uh-uh, we, we want more of Jesus. We want more of his teachings. Where's he going? We're running. 10 to 15,000 of people are running along the shore because they can't get enough of Jesus. They don't even plan how they're going to eat. They don't care because they have so much desire and hunger to be with Jesus and in the teaching of his word that he was giving. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this crowd, everybody there had pure motives of why they follow Jesus. Okay, so a lot of people came just for the miracles. But what's fascinating is when he shows up in the crowd, it doesn't say he starts doing miracles again. It says he starts teaching them again. That there was, enough, there was a lot of people in this crowd that, guys, they were so hungry to be in Jesus' presence. They were so hungry to meet him in his word that they didn't care. They didn't plan. That's why they didn't have much food because they weren't planning to be there other than the one boy and his mom that was planned out. Okay. But when I thought about that, I thought, oh, Lord, I'm so convicted. Do I have such a hunger and a desire to meet you every day when I get into your word? And am I excited to get into your word? Like this crowd was running to be with you and to receive your teaching? Lord, am I so hungry every Sunday morning that I'm like, I can't wait to show up at church to meet you in the presence of your people, to lift you up in passionate worship and music? To meet you in the preaching of your word. I can't wait to get to church. Lord, I can't wait to go to life group tonight or my DX group because I want to meet you in the presence of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Guys, do we have such passion and desire to be with God? Like this crowd seemed to have such a passion. They didn't even care about where their next meal was coming from. They wanted to be with Jesus. They wanted to get his word. Guys, my prayer is that God would continue to grow Salvation Church in one of our five values, and that is passionate worship. I would love that we would see more and more people are getting here early on Sunday mornings because they think, I want to get a good seat because I'm so looking forward to meeting Jesus today with my church. I look for, I want to see more and more people like, I can't wait to go to Life Group. I can't wait to go to DX Group. I can't wait to do that outreach thing. I can't wait because my passion for Jesus and his word, and his presence, and being used of him is so more important to me than anything else in this life. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand days anywhere else. Can we say that from the depths of our soul? Praise the Lord. Man, I'm so challenged by that. Join me in praying that our God would make our hearts be that. And the more and the more of us that do that, I'm telling you, you, I've seen it done before. 
in churches I've been a part of, where you saw more and more people said, I'm hungry, I'm coming. Even if I had a bad day or a bad night, I'm choosing to seek the Lord today. Let's get there. Let's get this worship on for Jesus. Let's get there and eat of God's word. And I'm telling you, the culture will grow and this place will more and more be on fire for Jesus Christ. And and last week, I got to go to a church where you can tell they're further along in that process. And it was so amazing to sit there in a room that's been packed and packed and packed more and more because God is working. And listen, he's working here, but he's not done here. Amen. He's just getting started here. He's only started like five months into this thing. And so, but it takes every one of us saying we're coming and we're letting it all out. We're not, we're leaving everything on the court. Okay, man, that's a whole sermon in of itself. Okay, let's move on. So here's the thing. So where was I? Here we go. So verse 39, they bring the five loaves, the two fish, and what does Jesus do? He commands them all to sit down in groups in the green grass. They sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he said a blessing. You know what that is? That's him praying for food. He's praying for a meal. You ever wonder, you know, you hear Christians, you know, maybe you do it yourself. You pray before you eat. This is where we get it from. Times like this, Jesus would pray and thank the Father for the meal that, that he's eating, that they're about to have. And, and so I just encourage you this. Do you pray when you eat meals? Do you pray individually before you, you eat something? Uh, you know, Jesus modeled it for us. Do you pray as a family in your homes? If you don't, husbands, fathers, it's you to lead. Put that on you. Okay, that's part of what it means to lead our family. You lead that prayer. Okay? Does it have to be eloquent and, you know, then no, not at all. Be raw, be real, be sincere, and just thank God. God, thank you for this food. Amen. That's as short as it needs to be. Okay? But like, like work that into your families. How about this one? Are we praying when we go and eat out in public? Okay? Now listen, I'm not trying to get legalistic here, but I'm just saying this. I'm really thankful as a family. I remember my parents, see, they were brand new believers when I was five years old. And I remember when they began to be taught this and think of, okay, Jesus would pray before meals and maybe we should pray even when we go out to eat in public. And I remember as a family, we began to pray in public and it was weird and what's going on. And and then we did it the rest of my life growing up. And I can't tell you how many times people would come up and say, man, that was awesome. We saw you pray and thank you for encouraging us that way. Or like even with my family too. Because here's the thing. Yeah, people are going to look at you. It's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you're, you're showing I'm thankful, God, for what you've done. It also proves, are you shamelessly committed to Jesus Christ? You know, like, are, you, are we unashamedly committed to Jesus Christ? You know, but also it's a, it's a witness to people. So just consider that. And so Jesus prays for the food. It says, then he broke the loaves. He gave it to the disciples to set before the people. So the disciples now have their part. And it says, and he divided the two fish among them all. In verse uh, 42, and so the disciples and the people, they broke off the smallest possible sizes of food to try to stretch it as far as these five loaves and two fish can get. And they got about 25 people before the food ran out. That's not what it says, right? You're lost or I'm lost or something. Is that what they did? You see, see? it's not like they're like, okay, here's a little bit there because we got to make Jesus look good here. He's crazy. Five loaves, two fish, like you get a little bit here, a little bit. Is that, is that what they do? No, look, verse 42. And they all ate and were satisfied. They, they didn't like try to do that. They just like, here it is. And it supernaturally multiplied as it was passed out. Verse 43. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So not only did Jesus supernaturally multiply the five loaves and the two fish to feed 10 to 15,000 people, but he also purposely had how many baskets full left in the end? 12. 12. Now, we don't know exactly, exactly why, but highly likely the guess of most theologians is this. How many disciples was he discipling and training? 12. And, and it's probable is that what he's doing, again, that all of this is about training them to get them to go eventually when he leaves this world. And he has the 12 left over. And again, he's, 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 this whole thing has been teaching them. Hey, you guys feed them. What, what did you find? 
You know, he, he's like, he's leaning on them. He could have easily just said, go get food. I know there's food out there and bring it here. I'm gonna multiply it. No, he, he's training them through this whole process. And so there happens to be 12 baskets full. And it's probable that he's saying to his disciples, don't you ever forget this day that when I send you out and you're on mission for me in life, I'm gonna provide your needs. I'm gonna provide what you need just like I provided here in a supernatural way. Even when you don't think there's a way for it to be provided, I'm gonna provide for the needs of what you have. And so here's a third point. When on mission, trust God to provide your needs. Do we trust God that he's gonna provide what we need when we're on mission for him? Now, I know in the life of our church, we have 10 people who are practicing this right now as we speak. By God's grace, God has called and he has a group of 10 of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are gonna go to the country of Guatemala this summer. They're gonna take the gospel to the Akai people, unreached people groups up in the remote mountains. But for them to go, they're trusting the Lord to provide specifically $2,500 each person to, to pay for everything from the transportation to the interpreter's fee, you know, uh, paying the interpreter so we can actually give the gospel in people's language that they need, et cetera, et cetera. $2,500 a person is the, the, the faith that every team member is asking the Lord to provide. And so would you join us in praying for the Lord to provide that for these 10 to go so that people, hopefully of that people group, can come to know Christ and, uh, and be saved. In fact, also, here's another point. A lot of times, God, when he provides for our needs, he does it through other courage and challenge you. Give and just see how the Lord will provide for your needs as you give to him through the work of the gospel through your local church. Now, let me finally broaden this out a little bit. What other things sometimes do we need God to provide for us as we are on mission for him? And one that I wanted to highlight as we end today is this, how many of us need more boldness when sharing the gospel, right? We need more boldness when sharing the gospel. That is a provision that God has promised to give us if we ask him for it. In fact, Paul himself said, check this out in Ephesians chapter six. He said, pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth, what? Boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it, what? Boldly. He says it twice in two sentences, as I ought to speak. We need boldness. We should have boldness when we go share the good news with our coworker or with our friends at school or with our neighbors or with some stranger on the street, or whoever and wherever they are, we need boldness to do it. And so uh, we need to ask God for things like this. So if it's finances for our personal life, if it's finances for a mission trip, if it's boldness to share the gospel, he has promised that he will help provide what we need. Just like he could supernaturally multiply five loaves and two fish to provide for the crowd that day, he can do it for us. And so here's the question. What specific mission is God calling you to do where you need to trust God to provide in a big way in your life? What is that in the days ahead? And I know for some of us, it's this. I know God wants me to share the gospel with someone. And I need God to provide me boldness. So we're going to do a little bit of something different on closing out our service today. We're going to sing a closing song. But I want, to, I want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. I want an opportunity to respond. And so I'm going to be up front over here. And um, I'm going to be willing to pray with you. If you, if you want prayer for God to give you boldness to share the gospel with someone in the days ahead, come up and get prayer. I'm telling you, when you get prayed over, God does stuff in our life. Or if you need prayer, like, listen, I financially, I need finances personally so I can pay the bills to continue to live on mission in my life. Come, and I'd love to pray over you. Or if you need prayer for something else, for a mission, let's not just sing a song, but if you want prayer, if you need prayer, I'd love to pray over you. 
And I'm going to ask Dean, Dean, would you mind? You'll come up on this side. Dean, we'd love to pray for you. I'm going to be up on this side as we close out. But let's sing. But if you want to be prayed for, let's do it. Let's stand and sing.